Hi, I'm Mikhail Javari. The title of our talk is Video Game Presentism in Archaeology. I'm the archaeology part. As an archaeologist by training, my research deals with the effects of colonialism in the Philippines. It's a far cry from the world of video games, but I have found myself returning to them time and again. I am deeply interested in the potential for video games to be a medium for teaching about cultural heritage, its conservation, and management. Mark and I have been thinking about how his work and mine could come together, and we wanted to use this conference paper as a test bed. So I suppose as a caveat, the ideas we're going to talk about here are by many metrics nascent. On top of that, we are 1,500 miles apart, so bear with us. Hello everyone, I'm Mark Noble and I'm discussing presentism in video games. This topic is the product of my research as a Literature and Writing Studies graduate student at CSU San Marcos. Like Mikhail, video games have been a lifelong interest and I'm always on the lookout for different ways to integrate the medium with my academic and professional life. In fact, a central component of my work strives to emphasize the versatility of video games and its applicability towards other disciplines. Presentism offers a way of discussing video games in a manner that serves this effort. We appreciate the opportunity to share these ideas, so without further ado, I will dive right into my segment of the presentation. Video games have always faced criticism for its entertainment value, its artistic merits, and certainly its place in academia. Its potential as a medium is only limited by the bounds of technology. And while this does allow video games to remain as a field ripe with innovation and progress, it faces the rare challenge of maintaining relevant scholarly discourse in the face of constant technological advancements. Despite these obstacles, video games are consistently proving to be a versatile interdisciplinary tool, and the field of archaeology is no exception. To illustrate this connection, I will discuss the concept I term as video game presentism, defined in part as engagement with the present realm of a video game, and more broadly speaking, a characterization of video game play as engagement with another present. Let's unpack that further by familiarizing ourselves with two terms as they relate to video games as a form of textual engagement. The first is interactivity, defined as a cyclic process between two or more active agents in which each agent alternately listens, thinks, and speaks. Crawford directs this notion towards video games, prompting us to imagine a metaphorical interaction between the gamer and the video game, and indirectly its designer. Second is the concept of presentism itself. Presentism is a mindset and critical lens that privileges the present and prioritizes the now, often at the expense of the future and disregarding possible lessons from the past. This is especially relevant to our current society and cultural values, which privileges the internet, high-speed technology, and social media platforms. All advancements founded upon principles of digital nowness like instant gratification, immediate access and communication, and so on. Rushkoff spends no small amount of time providing examples of this phenomenon and pondering its implications for humanity's ability to engage with any given present, actual or digital. I argue that video games are not too far removed based on how we interact with them, and that they are in fact a quintessential presentist medium. This means that a video game can and should be termed and perceived as a present in and of itself, one that exists in parallel to the actual, a digitally rendered and actuated present world that exists via player engagement and interaction. The solution is to properly consider engagement with video game content as a participatory, agentive interaction with an alternate present. This attribution is a key semantic difference as video games consequently assume elements of a presentist paradigm. As a present, video games further require a sense of urgency and immediacy in our engagement as they interfere with our actual present and distract us from the real world. What's the best first-person shooter about genetically modified space marines? Halo! Honey, have you been playing your new little video game all day? When you say it in that tone, it implies that Luke and I haven't been spending quality time together, which we have. Can I talk to him? Sure thing. Luke! I don't think he's here. I mean, I, I know he's not here. Where is he? I am certain he is probably out with his usual crew of cut-ups. You're not doing laundry, are you? God, no. I'm about to, if I'm supposed to. No, no, don't, don't. But can you vacuum out the dryer vent before I get home? I will absolutely do that. Thanks. I, can't... I therefore position video games as conflicting, distracting presents. 
because naturally, it is only possible to engage with one present at a time, as we see Phil attempt unsuccessfully to engage with two. Consider the following comparison and examples. The act of reading a book can be externally perceived, say as someone sitting in a chair and reading Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. The participation occurs internally, mentally, even emotionally, but solely in the mind and imagination. On the other hand, video games are digitally rendered realms navigable via analog controls, which constitute a more tangible action digitally realized on screen, and therefore becomes a more noticeable use of our time and effort. Now, I'm not trying to take anything away from the experience of reading a book, or other traditional forms of textual engagement. The Harry Potter books undoubtedly constitute participatory experiences and worlds of their own, but they exist solely in the mind and within the action of comprehending words and engaging in the subcreative imaginative process. Rather, my goal is to advocate for the video game experience and challenge the stigma on the traditional, visible act of playing a video game, which is often seen as a waste of time. This is easily subverted by replacing any instance of the phrase playing a video game with the actual activity rendered on screen, for example, say, fighting a horde of goblins at the gates of Elzebub, as seen in the following lampoon of World of Warcraft. Alright, just a few more feet, and here we are, gentlemen, the gates of Elzebub. Good oh. lord! Don't panic, this is what the last 97 hours have been about. Stay frosty, there's a horde of armed goblins on the other side of that gate guarding the Sword of Azeroth. Warriors, unsheath your weapons, magic wielders, raise your wands. Lock and load. Raj, blow the gates. Blowing the gates. Control, shift, B. Oh my god, so many goblins! Ah! Prehensile, I'll swat him off. I got him, Leonard. Tonight I spice my mead with goblin blood. If we lay out a similar scenario that includes an observer in a Venn diagram where the two circles denote two presents, the actual present and the digital video game present, we can infer several insights. Sheldor is back online. Sheldor? The Conqueror. What are you doing? AFK. I'm playing Age of Conan, an online multiplayer game set in the universe of Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian. Oh. Sheldor, back online. What's AFK? AFK. Away from keyboard. Oh, I see. What does that stand for? <laughs> One, an external observer only sees the player's interaction with the hardware, not with the in-game present. Two, the player, during gameplay, interacts with the in-game present. Three, the player is the only one fully aware of both presents. And four, since the player is only capable of engaging with one present at a time, the player therefore experiences a sort of tug of war resulting from both presents competing for the attention of the singular physical self. With these principles of interactivity and presentism in place, I argue that video game presentism establishes video game play as a form of engagement that constitutes real-time action and experiences. And it is here that I uncover an alignment with Mikhail's discipline for the inherent interdisciplinary nature of video games. I think Mark's presentism provides a basis for understanding exactly how video games are important for archaeology, and why photorealistic 3D renderings of sites, on their own, may not elicit as strong a response as a gamified version might. Furthermore, I hope to lay the groundwork for explicitly framing the act of video game play as an informal archaeology, by which I mean that the way we interrogate the artifacts and the data we collect to generate knowledge is built into gameplay even if the tools and methods of archaeology may not map very well into a game space. Archaeologists think from things, as Alison Wiley famously wrote. We routinely argue that archaeology is among the disciplines best equipped to make sense of the material world, 
and many already argue that archaeologists are well equipped indeed to study video games. Andrew Reinhardt has led an archaeological survey of the game No Man's Sky by Hello Games, for instance. Reinhardt, in that instance, illustrates my point. Video games are 100% archaeological material. Games can be thought of as both sites and artifacts. We can know their function, to entertain, to heal, to teach. We can infer their creation through coding, story writing, teamwork. And crucially, we can ask questions of them and then play them to answer those questions. Here's where Mark's presentism and engagement come into play. He argues that unlike books, we can go back into a game and have different experiences each time. I can ask about a game, what can the objects the developers place around the world tell me about how they perceive our culture? The developers themselves may answer completely differently than what their material culture may imply. Hopefully, this establishes that we can apply archaeological questions and method to video games. I'm going to switch gears just a bit now. Intuitively, we know that video games can be better conveyors of different types of information than books. Video games, as presentism, tells us that players are actually disengaging with their present to engage in an alternate present, that of the game. Players aren't touring a town, they are experiencing that town whilst they go about other business. Players develop attachments to locations, objects, and people in games because of those experiences. In a way, this helps us understand archaeologists and their relationship to archaeology. A question we often ask ourselves is, why is it so difficult to impart the excitement, the respect, the wonder about the archaeology in the sites we excavate and analyze? When we know this answer intuitively as well, it's because it's next to impossible to tell someone what it is like to learn about the site through experience and then analysis. We as archaeologists, in a way, experience the archaeology through a kind of presentist lens. We know the sites we work on very well. They exist to us in a form of present that we cannot convey. Players have that same problem when trying to explain the experience of gameplay to their parents or loved ones. The comparisons are striking. The deeply experiential nature of video game play is what draws players to Skyrim for the myriad of reasons that Emily Johnson records in her 2013 thesis, in which she explores how people engage with Bethesda's 2011 game, Skyrim. Some say that they were playing the game to experience Viking culture. Others stated that they wanted to explore the world and answer questions about the larger lore of the Elder Scrolls. Both of these modes of play are informal archaeological experiences. Players who want to experience the Viking culture play the game by constantly checking their assumptions about Viking culture to inform their play. They are actively telling a just-so story about the Viking past. Players who are trying to learn something about the Elder Scrolls meta story search the world for clues. They look at the world map and visit areas to see if they correlate to lore. It's clear that both of these types of players are heavily invested. Elizabeth Sampat calls video games empathy engines. She states that the very nature of gameplay means that the games are uniquely able to elicit an empathetic response from the player. Sampat's empathy engines and Mark's alternate presence are the perfect vehicle for allowing the public to not only learn about the past, but to become engaged with it. If we can take those ideas to heart and provide people with ways to engage with digital versions of archaeological heritage in ways that allow them to experience the act of learning about a site through archaeological inquiry, we will have achieved more than an informed public. We will have achieved an empathetic public. <laughs>